Hello calculus, let's get into some test prep problems here. We are starting off with this first one of the multiple choice. This is probably the hardest one on here. I'm going to show you why uh, it's pretty challenging for a lot of kids. So I'm going to underline some of the most important things here. First of all, uh, it's a, con <laughs> okay, I was about to underline everything because really there's continuous, there's decreasing, there's critical point, and there's must be false. Man, that's important, must be false. So let's take this one at a time. Continuous meaning we're not going to have any breaks anywhere along the function. Decreasing meaning it's going down as you move left to right the whole time. Uh, we're going on the interval 0 to 10, so that's fine. And then critical point at 4, 2. So if we have a critical point at this, at this uh, coordinate point, what that means is that either the derivative at 4 has to equal 0, or the derivative at 4 does not exist. So one of those two things is going to have to be true in order for this to happen. So when we look at must be false, we're looking for which one of these has to be false. So in other words, if it could be true, it's not our answer. So that means either of these two things, it could be true. The derivative might equal 0 or the derivative does not exist. Okay, so now how could the derivative not not exist? Because if it was like going down and then it had a sharp corner and it was going down even more, how could the derivative equal zero if it's always decreasing? Because you'd think if it's decreasing that the derivative is always negative. Well, it could be for a split second like a, a cubic function that's going down. And just for one split second, it could be the derivative equaling zero just at that one point. Uh, so that's a possibility. So that's why both of these at some point could be true. So I'm putting check marks next to the ones that could be true. Okay, so now what? We can't have a relative max or min, right? So there's not a max or min because it's always decreasing. So it says is neither. It's like a double negative. It must be false. This is actually true. There's neither a relative max or a minimum. So that's a true statement. Uh, and then this an absolute minimum from 0 to 10. Well, if it's decreasing the whole time from 0 to 10, then yeah, that's going to be the lowest point on there. So that would be a minimum. So that one's also true. That leaves us with this. So let me explain why that one would uh, have to be false. Because we've already said here that at 4, one of these two things has to be true. Either the derivative is 0 or the derivative does not exist because it's a critical point. The derivative cannot be less than zero if it has to be one of these two things. Okay, so it's either one of those two, it can't be less than zero. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense since it, I, we know it's one of those two. Numbers two and three, we're gonna use the graph here, this crazy weird graph, it's got all these twists and turns on it. So we're looking for here the y values. If we add up these two y values, so we have an, the y value here, and, yeah, you know, I'm going to argue or uh, not argue. I'm going to complain to Mr. Brust right now because this is stretched out and he should have made this square because this looks misleading when it's uh, these rectangles are stretched up and down. Uh, so this is about, I don't know, negative 0. Point something, 0. 0.2-ish. I'm just guessing. And this f of 2, where's f of 2? It's way up here at 1. So if you add those together, yeah, that's going to be bigger than 0. So that one works. We're looking for false again. Uh, f of negative 1. So that's up here positive. So that's a positive number. And then the derivative of negative 1. So if we go over here to the derivative, okay, that's negative. So the question is, is it greater than 0? Okay, I don't like this one problem right here, just this part B, because we don't know for sure what the derivative is. I know that the, the y value here is almost 1, so let's estimate, I'm going to put a little estimate here, that it is about 0 0.8 or so. So what about this? Well, this slope is not steeper than uh, than 0 0.8. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, that slope right there would just be a slope of negative 1. Okay, so that's not even anywhere close to that. So what I'm thinking is that this one is going to be this slope is going to be uh, not as steep as a negative 0.8. So that's why I think this one is true. But we'll come back to that one. I'll put a question mark on it. Because I think you'll see with some of the other things that we do that the other what one of these other ones is obvious. All right, so the derivative at negative 1 
times the derivative at negative 2. So the derivative here is negative, the derivative here is positive. So we have a negative and a positive. And when you multiply those things together, you get a negative. That is less than 0, so that one's true. Uh, f of 1 times the slope at 1. So f of 1 is a negative. So we have a negative number here. And the slope is also negative. Negative and a negative. We have two negatives here. That's a positive. Okay, so this one is definitely for sure false. That's why that one has to be the answer. We could keep looking at the others, but you can see here this is going to be a positive number, so that f of 0 is positive, and that slope right there is positive. That's greater than 0, so yeah, that, one's, that one works. It's true. D is the only one that has to be false for sure. So critical numbers. If you remember, critical numbers are where the derivative does not exist, or the derivative, excuse me, derivative does not exist, or the derivative is 0. So the derivative being 0 is when we have like these nice smooth curves. So we have a derivative, a, a critical number there, 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 and there. So you just count them up. That's all you're doing. Count up the mins and maxes. You don't worry about the endpoints because the endpoints are not critical numbers. While they are candidates, though, candidates for max and mins, they're not actually critical numbers. Number four. Here we have this function. Give the distance of a moving particle. Starting point is a function of time. For what value is the instantaneous velocity of the particle equal to its average velocity. So the instantaneous velocity is just x prime. So we want to know when does x prime of t equal the average velocity over this interval. The average velocity is just the slope. So we're going to say x of 8 minus x of 0 over, and then what, 8 minus 0. So here we just have the slope. So all you have to do now is we're going to say this is 2 thirds, x raised to the negative 1 third because I subtracted 1 from 2 thirds. That gives us to negative 1 third. And then that's going to equal what's x of 8. So that's going to be the cube root of 8 squared minus the cube root of 0 squared. And then that's all over 8. Okay, let's simplify this more. So this one becomes 2 over 3 cube root of x uh, equals, okay, so here I would not go 8 squared first. Don't do 8 squared to get 64. I would take the cube root first. The cube root of 8 is 2, and then it's 2 squared. So that whole thing is 4. Again, take the cube root first, make it smaller, then square it. So it's 4 minus 0, so 4, and then on bottom is 8. All right, so this is just a one-half. So now what can I do? I could multiply both sides. Two-thirds equals, this is one-half. Multiply both sides by the cube root of x. Cube root of x. Multiply both sides by 2. You get four-thirds equals cube root of x. And then you raise it, uh, everything to the third power, and you'll be able to find your answer. So this is just the algebra part. This here, though, just as a reminder, this is the mean value theorem when you take the instantaneous rate of change and set it equal to the average rate of change. That's the mean value theorem. Number five is another tricky one. So some students will ask, how are you supposed to be able to do this without a calculator? If you needed to, if you could graph it, then this would be a lot easier. You just say which one, like what's the lowest point, what's the highest point and all that. But uh, here's what we really need to do. Let's figure out where this function starts. Let me change colors. So let's figure out what's f of 1. Let's also figure out what is f of e squared. So we'll know what these values are on the intervals. And then let's plug in any critical points. Because critical points uh, that I don't know yet, critical points will give us a possible max and min. So uh, if I plug in an f of 1, this is just going to be the natural log of 1 over 1. Well, the natural log of 1 is 0, so that equals 0. If I do e squared, I'm going to get the natural log of e squared over uh, e squared, which then this equals 2 over e squared. Okay, and now what about a critical point? Critical points will happen when the derivative equals uh, 0 or does not exist. Remember that this is uh, u prime v minus u v prime all over v squared. So the top one first, 1 over x. 
leave the second one alone, leave that x alone minus. Now we leave the natural log of x alone, natural log of x, and times it by the derivative of the bottom, which is 1. And then that's all over x squared. Simplify this, we're going to get 1, that just simplifies to 1, minus natural log of x all over x squared. All right, so we have a critical point. This, does, this is the derivative, f prime of x. And we have a critical point when x equals 0, because that would make the denominator a 0. But 0 is outside this uh, interval, so we don't care about that. Well, what about when does this thing equals equals 0, the whole, the whole fraction? That's when the numerator equals 0. So if I solve that, I'm going to get the natural log of x equals 1, um, raise it e raised to both sides. That gives us x equals e. So e is a critical point. That's a possibility of having a max or a min. So let's come back up here and plug in an e, because if we, we need to check the max and mins. We're trying to find what's the lowest and what's the highest. So now let's plug this into the original function. Natural log of e over uh, e, right? Yeah, because I'm just plugging in an e. And then that equals 1 over e. Okay, so which one's the smallest? 0 is the smallest. All right, so that's my small one. So I know that it has to start with f of 1. So if, as I look over here, it's got to be either a or b. So that narrows me down to 50-50 chance. And then I have to think, which one's the biggest one? 2 divided by e squared or 1 divided by e? e squared is big, but if a bigger number on is on bottom, that means this is actually... Yeah, that's right. This is this this one is smaller than this one. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. If the number on bottom is bigger, then this one's actually smaller. Now it's not as small as this one, because this is zero, so that's definitely the smallest. But this is the biggest one. So it's when you plug in an E. So that's why that one's the answer. Whoa, that was confusing. Hopefully you can follow that. The critical values, though, when you find those critical values, those are candidates for being like a, the highest or lowest point. So those are important to be able to plug those in and see which one was biggest or smallest. Last one here, we're going to use a calculator, but I'm not going to show you the calculator part. You can do that part on your own. Let me just show you how you would set this up. So we're doing the mean value theorem again. And if you remember, mean value theorem is exactly what I did here on this one, where you take the instantaneous rate of change and set it equal to the slope. That is the mean value theorem, and you figure out when that happens. So let's do it here. So we're going to take f prime of x and set it equal to the slope, f of 4 minus f of 1 all over uh, 4 minus 1. Okay, so this is all you have to do to get this correct. So uh, you take the derivative of this. So I'm not going to do this whole thing for you, but you take the derivative, and whatever the derivative is, let's just plug it into y1. So y1 is going to be the derivative of f. I will tell you, you're going to have product rule here because you have x times sine x. So make sure you do the product rule. Okay, so that's what you plug in y1. Now in y2, you're going to plug in the slope. Okay, so you'll have to actually figure out what these are, plug in, a, plug in the 1, plug in the 4, figure out what that whole fraction is. It'll be some crazy decimal, and you plug that in to y2. And whatever that's, that slope is, on the average slope between those two points, you see where those two things cross. That'll give you the answer. And that's the end. Hopefully that was helpful for you.